D.E. Recorder Galair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. The generally accepted date for the start of the War of Independence is the 21st of January 1919, but there was no declaration of war, no grand offensive ordered by the political and military leadership. Instead, a small ambush in Tipperary left two RIC officers dead just hours before Dáil Éireann convened in Dublin. In the weeks leading up to the first meeting of the Dáil, members of the Irish Volunteers had grown suspicious of the politicians pushing themselves to the front of the Republican movement. They had little faith in what could be achieved by talk, and argued that the Irish Republic could only be established by force of arms. At Solohead Beg, Tipperary's Big Four were determined to start a war before Dáil Éireann could meet, but its occurrence on the same day gave it tremendous symbolic importance in later years. In February, Michael Collins helped break Eamon de Valera out of prison, hoping that he would lead the military campaign that Collins felt was inevitable. Instead, de Valera made things intolerable for militants, as Collins would later write, pushing ahead with his own goals of securing Irish representation at the Paris Peace Conference and gaining recognition of the Irish Republic from the United States. It's worth noting that Michael Collins didn't establish the squad until after de Valera departed for America in June. Following this, violence escalated slowly throughout 1919. There was clearly a desire by those on the ground to fight, and there were sporadic attacks throughout the country, but these were carried out without approval from General Headquarters of the IRA, led by Chief of Staff Richard Mulcahy. GHQ was concerned that attacks would not have public support, and were committed to the government's policy of achieving independence through peaceful means. In the first year of the War of Independence, just 15 RIC and DMP officers were killed, and there is an argument that the start date of the conflict should thus be pushed forward to January of 1920, when the first attacks sanctioned by GHQ took place. This started off a year in which 179 police would be killed, many of them British Black and Tans, in dramatic actions the length and breadth of the country. It's unclear what motivated this sudden change of direction by General Headquarters, but there are a couple of possible reasons. First, the political approach had achieved little and was being shut down by the British authorities. Dáil Éireann had been suppressed, Sinn Féin was declared illegal and its members were being arrested and deported. Ireland had been ignored utterly at the Paris Peace Conference and de Valera had achieved little of material worth in the United States. In August, members of the Irish Volunteers swore allegiance to Dáil Éireann, prompting them to rebrand as the Irish Republican Army. As the Army of the Republic, it was their duty to defend the institutions of the Republic and strike back at those who would suppress them. Another possible reason was the decision by British authorities to begin recruiting for the Royal Irish Constabulary from amongst the ranks of World War I ex-servicemen. The Dáil boycott in April of 1919 against the RIC saw them ostracised by their communities, resignations rocketed and the numbers wishing to join the force fell to dangerously low levels. In late 1919, rural barracks were abandoned so that others could be reinforced, and the attacks from January onwards often sought to destroy barracks before new recruits could move in. There was also the issue of maintaining army discipline. General Headquarters was able to exert only limited control over the units throughout Ireland and had difficulty enforcing its authority in 1919. Some of the ranks looked to General Headquarters with as much suspicion as they did the politicians, regarding them as pinpushers sitting in Dublin doing nothing. The refusal to sanction attacks in 1919 only worsened this attitude. As mentioned in the last episode on Thomas McCurtain, some of the men in the Court No. 1 Brigade distrusted him because of his close ties to those in Dublin. By authorising attacks, General Headquarters may have been trying to maintain discipline and restore confidence, and it should come as no surprise that the first sanctioned attack took place in the Court No. 1 Brigade's area. On the 2nd of January 1920, members of the Brigade's 4th Battalion, under the command of Michael Leahy, cut the telephone lines to carry Tuhill RIC barracks and blocked approach roads in preparations for an assault. Just before midnight, the men fired a volley on the barracks before Leahy called for its surrender. When this was refused, he ordered that gelignite be used to blow a hole in the gable wall. A breach was created and when the men entered, they found that the RIC had retreated upstairs. Instead of trying to fight their way up, the IRA began to shoot into the ceiling, which resulted in the garrison's surrender. Two further attacks in Cork that night failed, as did an attack on Drumlish RIC barracks in Longford, led by Sean McKeown on the 6th of January. 
Gelignite was again used in an attempt to blow a hole in the barrack wall, but it failed to explode as it had been stored in freezing temperatures. On the 15th of January, a number of IRA officers were elected to local councils throughout Ireland, strengthening their position in Sinn Féin at a time when many of the party moderates were on the run or in prison. In Thurlis, on the night of the 20th of January, Constable Luke Finnegan, having just finished duty, was shot outside his house by four men and died two days later. When they received the news that he had been shot, the RIC in Thurlis smashed the windows of the local Sinn Féin Hall and in the houses of prominent party members. This was the first reprisal carried out by the RIC. The following day, the 21st, District Inspector W.C. Forbes Redmond was shot dead in Dublin by the squad, only a few weeks after he had been summoned from Belfast to reorganise the Dublin Metropolitan Police. These two killings, as well as the attempt on the life of the Lord Lieutenant in December, prompted Lloyd George to tell the Daily Chronicle that It is obvious that if these murderous clubs pursue their course much longer, we may see counter-clubs springing up and the lives of prominent Sinn Féiners becoming as unsafe as prominent officials. By the end of the year, his government would sanction official reprisals by the RIC, allowing them to respond to IRA attacks by burning houses, destroying property and turning a blind eye to cases of murder. One of the first victims of this policy would be Thomas McCurtain, elected Lord Mayor of Cork on the 30th of January. On that day, local councils met for the first time since the election with numerous declarations of loyalty made to the suppressed Thal Aaron. On the 12th of February, Sean Hales led an attack on Alahee's RIC barracks near Castletown Bear in County Cork. At around 3 o'clock in the morning, volunteers began drilling holes in the gable wall so as to place sticks of gelignite, which alerted the garrison inside. They fired on the attackers and continued to do so after a hole was blown in the wall. Constable Michael Neenan was shot in the abdomen when he left cover in an attempt to get more ammunition for the defenders. He died later in the day from his wound and was the first member of the RIC to posthumously receive the Irish Constabulary Medal. Their stout defence caused the IRA to retreat after two hours, but the damage had been done. The RIC later destroyed the barracks and withdrew from the village, leaving the majority of the Beira Peninsula without a police presence. Two days later, the barracks at Ballytrain in Monaghan was attacked in a similar fashion. The garrison was called on to surrender. They refused, and so the gable wall was blown in with explosives. The assault was carried out by Owen O'Duffy, the officer commanding the Monaghan Brigade, under the watchful eye of Ernie O'Malley, who had been sent to the county as an organiser by General Headquarters, travelling from company to company and assisting with training. O'Duffy had come to prominence as Provincial Secretary of the GAA, and the assault on Ballytrain Barracks was the start of a military career that would see him become Chief of Staff in January of 1922. More barrack attacks were carried out in Cork, and on the 27th of February, brothers Tom and Sean Hales led simultaneous attacks on two RIC barracks in the west of the county. The wind that shakes the barley was loosely based on the Hales brothers. During the Civil War, Tom fought on the anti-treaty side, while four prisoners were executed by the provisional government after Sean, a TD and pro-treaty officer, was shot dead outside Thal Aaron. March saw an escalation in unsanctioned attacks on RIC patrols, which resulted in further retaliation. Houses were wrecked in Cork City on the 12th following the killing of an RIC constable the previous day. Two more were killed in Tipperary on the 17th, and on the 19th, Constable Joseph Murta was killed on his way home from one of their funerals. Hours later, early on the morning of his 36th birthday, Tomás McCurtain was shot dead by men with blackened faces following a number of threats to his life. An attempt was made to blame an internal IRA feud, but it was likely carried out by the local RIC. These were only a handful of the events which took place in early 1920, and this new phase culminated in the nationwide destruction of 300 abandoned barracks and 100 tax offices on the 5th of April. This was carried out to prevent them from being reoccupied by the Black and Tans, who had been in Ireland since January, but arrived in large numbers in March. It also acted as a massive morale boost for the IRA and saw the RIC driven out of large parts of rural Ireland with little hope that they would be able to return. There was now a real sense that the War of Independence had begun. Instead of the random attacks with little purpose as in 1919, the IRA was now carrying out well-planned assaults against police infrastructure on the authority of General Headquarters. 
But their success in early 1920 was a double-edged sword. They put hundreds of barracks out of commission and drove the RIC out of large parts of Ireland, but, aided by the Black and Tans, the barracks that remained were reinforced to a level where they could not be attacked by the IRA. From here, the embittered remnants of the RIC, the Black and Tans, and later the Auxiliaries, would range out in search of insurgents, bringing prisoners back to these fortresses where a suspicious number would be killed while trying to escape. Soon, IRA tactics would be forced to change again, breaking up into small units called flying columns and ambushing isolated patrols with little to no direction from general headquarters. Some of these ambushes have become the stuff of legend, and I will be taking a closer look at them as we approach their anniversaries. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. There will be more coming shortly on the events leading up to the declaration of a state of emergency in 1939, as well as continued coverage of the events of the War of Independence. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slongafol.